Mr. President, you are not dealing with a national party that has seen its own demise and that is willing to compromise. You are dealing here with your own comrades right. who will kill you if necessary in order for them not to go to prison because the stakes are too high. He could negotiate with the national party to say, I will not put you in prison. Mm -hmm. If you um, accept the settlement, I will not prosecute. I will not kick you out of your jobs. I will share the cabinet with you. He can't say that to the RET forces. Yes, good morning. Soli Mueng again here. Welcome to Worldview, the number one media company where we explore everyone's perspective on things that can broaden our own perspective. This morning, we have a third ex-ambassador of South Africa in a row. I say, I, this is just, <laughs> it was never planned to be this way, but uh, obviously these people who've had so much experience with South Africa inside, outside the history, the arms struggle, or the struggle against apartheid and the you know uh, evolution of our society since we came to where we are at uh, we have a lot to tell us to teach us we have a lot to learn from them so ambassador rasul you know i never know when to, whether to call you ambassador rasul mr rasul ibrahim what do you prefer me to call you i think you should call me ibrahim okay ibrahim thank you very much for accepting to engage to engage with me on this platform. I have been looking forward to this discussion. You know, I always discuss, I always enjoy some of the things I hear you say, right? And, and I think there's a lot that you can teach a lot of South Africans who have a perception of you as just that politician from the African National Congress. So maybe, obviously it's inevitable. Let's talk about where Ibrahim started. Just you know, two minutes, you know, your, your participation in the arms struggle, how you got in there. And I'm more interested to know where what your feelings are in terms of where South Africa is today? Hmm. Look, just a very brief synopsis. My first experience of apartheid was in 1972. I was about 10 years old. Um, I came home one day and all our furniture in District 6 Cape Town had been placed on the pavement and the instruction from the Group Areas Act had been for us to move. My father scrambled around for a truck, for a house and everything. And that's when we moved to the Cape Flats. So that was an indelible political moment in my life. The second one was the Arab-Israeli war in 1973, the so-called Yom Kippur war. And that gave me a reach for global politics. By 1976, I entered high school and tasted my first tear gas and saw a rubber bullet in the 1976 uprisings in a very limited way. By 1980, I was on the student representative council of my school, Livingston High School, and was in the leadership with a committee of 81 in the Western Cape of an 11 week school boycott. And from there, they say, um, it's all history. I joined the UDF on its executive in 1983 in the Western Cape. Um, from there, it was a short step towards the African National Congress as the premier liberation movement. And so my life has been probably divided into about five phases, an intense anti-apartheid phase in struggle. The second one, a short but very meaningful transitional phase where I saw how you make peace, how you settle conflicts and move the country forward. The third was a golden era of governance with Mandela and then later Thabo Mbeki in place. And then just as Zuma arrived on the scene, my diplomatic phase started, which was formal at first ambassador to Washington, but later became a very informal one. I became an ambassador, particularly in the context of the Muslim world, the Arab Springs and all of those kind of things, who were trying to understand the phenomenon of a Muslim leader who could be elected to governance to become the premier in a majority province. Uh -huh. um, how was that even possible when most Muslims don't live under conditions of democracy? And so in a sense, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very injured um, part of the world, the Muslim world. And when people like myself gain expertise and experience in terms of um, managing a dem democratic life, a life with rights and freedom, 
I think we have an obligation to share that um, with a very troubled part of the global world. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel that the South African Muslim community is an injured community? I mean, I, it's always said that you know, Muslims in South Africa. My experience of them is that they are very tolerant and they they have integrated fairly well into a society that's so diverse. And and then we there is not particular. I'm not aware of any particular discrimination against the Muslim community in South Africa or anger on behalf of them that they are not part of the community. Or am I am I living in La La Land? No, Sully, you're, you're absolutely right. This is the most harmonious, integrated, um, happy Muslim community anywhere in the world, whether yeah. majority or minority. It is here where we don't live under authoritarianism like most Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa live. Right. It is here where we don't live with Islamophobia like Muslims in Europe and North America live. And that's precisely what makes the responsibility on us to export the formula to a very injured global Muslim community from a very small but harmonious integrated. What I do fear for the Muslims in South Africa now since arriving back from the USA is that they are utilizing, if not misusing this freedom this freedom of speech that they have, this freedom of association, this freedom to be who they are in ways which are counterproductive. They isolate when before integrating with others was the formula. They are living the lives of elitists um, rather than continuing their commitment to the poor. Internally, they have the luxury to denounce those that they differ with, to cut them off from the mainstreams of society um, and to demobilize themselves from ongoing political struggle. So they're acting now not as agents of transformation, but right. as victims of transformation. So I think you are right, but I think we're fraying at the edges. Right. Is there, is there a united leadership of the South African Muslim community? Is there such, is it, are they homogenous? Is there, are there voices that can stand up above the fray and say, Guys, 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 or oh, fellow brothers and sisters, we are going astray here. How about this, this, and this? Unfortunately, you know, I always say, and this is the global problem with Muslims, mm -hmm. the wonderful thing about Islam is that it has no Pope. And so we have this wonderful diversity. Right. The bad thing about Islam is that it has no Pope. There is no coherent voice in a time of strife and contestation. Right. And so that's what the Muslim community in South Africa is beginning to suffer from. Mm -hmm. And the problem then is that it's a race to the bottom. Who can be more extreme? Who can right. be more strict about Islam? Who can right. be more austere in their interpretations um, of, of Islam? Who can be harder on gays? Mm -hmm. Who can be harder on secularization, etc., cetera, right. etc., cetera, as opposed to saying, let's think about this. Let's move forward. Let's recoil from the worst of what is done in our name. And let's find a sustainable path forward. So you were, you were premier of the Western Cape province. Cape Town was for many years you know, promoted as one of the most gay-friendly cities in South Africa, probably the most gay-friendly. We also have produced wine, uh, which is one of the biggest ex agricultural exports of the Western Cape and therefore South Africa. And you're a Muslim leader of this province who, at the time when you became premier, you moved into the formal, you know, official residence of the premier. I imagine that from time to time you had to receive guests for, on behalf of us, the residents of the Western Cape, in, at this, at this um, residence. Did you serve wine? How did you do, how did you do with the, all those contradictions? Uh, one voice promoting this city, the main city of the Western Cape, Cape Town, as gay, the most gay friendly, and having to, 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 to boast about some of our products, including especially the wine, to your guests in this official residence. Look, I think that that was a time when people appreciated integrity more than, say, the products. And so they rather wanted a premier who could stick by his principles as opposed to one who was for sale to any interest group. My, my approach was that while I have religious objections to alcohol, it was 
forbidden for me as a Muslim, but not for those who do not abide by the same rules that I. And so I could not impose my views on them, right. but they also respected that in my personal space where my family lives, we will not serve wine, but I did not stop wine at state functions. We'd move it where people needed it. We'd move it into hotels, into convention centers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's navigating all of those kind of things. I probably, and it wasn't because we were looking for it, we were filling quotas and so forth, but I had the privilege to work with some of the most outstanding people who right. happened to be gay or lesbian. Um, I remember uh, Ivor Doms. Mm -hmm. You don't get better health professionals than him or a Sheila Lipinski. Um, you don't get more committed um, people like her in the public service. And right. so for me, I was looking for merit, wherever merit comes from. And if they happen to be that, I would manage it. I would not say I do not employ this person because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a natural way of getting the best for our province. And, um, and, and it was in much the same way that I was humbled for the National AIDS Conference that was convened in Cape Town while I was the Minister of Health here right. um, to get an amazing standing ovation. I thought I was just being true to my Islamic non-discriminatory equal self in, 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 in dealing with the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And here was a whole wall full of people, half of whom were probably of the LGBTQ community appreciating right. that I could rise above um, some of the things that I may not myself be comfortable with, but that I could see the bigger cause. And so for me, that's the formula and that's yeah. the winning. That's what made Islam the great civilizer in Andalusia um, in its golden era and produced great civilization. But during that period, did you not find yourself having to go back to explain to your community why why you why you did certain things, why you took to took certain stances? Did you were you ever judged for being too tolerant? There were the fringes who judged me, but the key, as you mentioned, is the fact that you must stay in dynamic communication with right. your community. I was probably doing the sermons every week at some or other mosque um, in the Western Cape. I was probably meeting every fortnight with the ulama, the clerical leadership of the Muslim community, taking them through how I thought about all of these things. And for me to do that, I needed to educate myself a lot more about Islam so Sorry. that I could be able to give them a sustainable and Islamically sustainable explanation as to what it is that I am busy with. One of the major um, challenges is, for example, the termination of pregnancies, colloquially called abortions, right. that I had to implement. I did not make the decision that was in the National Assembly, but I had to implement that law. But mm -hmm. I did it in a way that I said, I will actually reduce the number of backstreet abortions that are right. taking place anyway in, in the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. And what would do that? And we found that we located it at a few institutions where people could come. We made it safe for them to be able to come without judgment. Mm -hmm. We put at their disposal um, um, consultants or therapists who could talk them through their decision. And more often than not, we changed their minds because the the, the anxiety and the fear in their heads were so overwhelming right. to bring them to this point of termination that no one could intervene in that and work them through it and show them that there are alternatives. So you see, sometimes, as the Quran says, a thing appears bad for you, but there's good in it. And sometimes a thing appears good for you, but there's bad in it. And right. the art is to know the difference. So the, the African National Congress was very divided when you were Premier of the Western Cape. There was what some people call the Africanists and another group. I don't remember what they had, what they called them. And, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and eventually it lost uh, the, the, the governance of the Western Cape. 
when you look at that period, you know, having to deal with the opposition DA at the time and your own comrades in the African National Congress who are not making life hard for you, what, what, what lessons did you draw from that? Look, for me, that was a, a kind of triple tragedy. Mm. It was personal tragedy because I had to, in a sense, step out of myself. Um, do the things I preferred not to do, that sometimes you've got to fight for power in order to save a bigger cause. And you then have to get into the gutters to really slug it out um, with some of your opponents. And so in that sense, it's a, it's a tragedy that we have had to do that and that we've had to fight those internal battles. Um, it's a political tragedy because... Yeah. In a sense, we can look back on that period and say, there was that period when we won 46% of the vote. But the last opinion poll by 2007, 2008 showed that we were up to 53%, that my personal approval rating as premier was at 60%. Um, and that's when um, the proverbial um, stuff hit the fan. Um, and Zuma came into power in the ANC, in Polokwane, in that year, um, his acolytes thought this was the moment to get rid of me, and they succeeded. But mm. history shows that we have moved from the high of 46% down to 28%. The last election in the city of Cape Town, we are under 20%. So I'm hoping that those who won the day will, will reflect on the yeah. cost of their victory. And then I think it was also just a social tragedy. The Western Cape has become even more divided along class and race lines. Um, we fragmented in terms of criminality and impunity. The ANC has become a travesty um, in the sense of the corruption that has, that has taken root within it. The Zuma years that are an unmitigated disaster. So it exacerbated pre-existing fault lines of inequality, of racism, of tentative governance that existed before Zuma. But it was as if Zuma came along and ripped um, the body apart and um, set loose the dogs of war on ourselves. Look, by, by, by everything I've heard, you were a brilliant ambassador of South Africa in, the, in Washington. Uh, people who worked at the embassy, some of them friends of mine, were really relieved at your arrival. People from outside who dealt with the, with the South African embassy in Washington were very happy with the way you led that. But do you think that Zuma was getting rid of you or sidelining you when he sent you to Washington? Was it because the NC is known to either either reward criminals by sending them to our embassies around the world, or if they want to remove you from a, from a, playing a role at home in the political situation, they took you out there. Do you think it was it was politics in sending you to Washington? Look, there were politics, but it was counter-instinctive politics. Remember, um, the National Executive Committee of the ANC in July 2008 asked me to resign as right. premier and hand over the premiership to Lynn Brown, uh -huh. which, I, which I did because it was a relief at that point to be extricated from that uh -huh. constant infighting that right. was required and then maintain a regal face to the people of the province and not show them your pain. So. Uh -huh. So, so it's clear there was a decision to get rid of me. Um, do you talk? Do you talk to some of those people who were on the on the Africanist side of the African National Congress at the time? And they were, or are you now? Have you be, since become comrades, friends? Do you laugh about it, or has that wedge between the, you and them remained, you know, solid? No, look, I think that um, it's it's hard to laugh about it mm. um, because it was not a personal tragedy; it was a socio-political tragedy. Right. But I have a working relationship with some of those people simply because their early seduction by Zuma mm -hmm. has given rise to the decade that was um, wasted. And yeah. they see that. And they would admit today that they sided with Zuma because the enemy's enemy was their friend. Um, and so in, in, in a very real sense, we work together because they now also want to get rid of the corruption. They're part of the renewal program. And, 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 and I think it's a kind of all hands on deck because 
the ANC has been invaded by very dark forces and everyone you can win in order to a, save the movement, save the country, um, save um, the, 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 the aura of the liberation movement, I think must be done. So we wouldn't laugh about it, but I think we found a, a kind of working relationship um, okay. that is there. Yeah, we'll come back to the ANC because there's so much to say about the ANC. But I want to ask about while you were ambassador of South African of South African Washington and Zuma was president, what was it like? How is it like to represent a country whose president was what he was? Look, was it easy? Was it tough? Did you have to let me, in... let, let me answer that by finishing off what you asked before and before I distracted myself. Okay. By the time um Obama became president. Mm -hmm. There was this picture in some newspapers of me hosting Obama in my office when I was premier and he was only the senator. So we had known each other before he became president. Mm -hmm. It was at that point. So the politics that was in there was the fact that I knew Obama since 2006. He became president in the 2008 election, sworn in 2009. Uh -huh. And by 2010, Jacob Zuma asked me, um, and we had some chat mm -hmm. about what went down. He went, we joked about why I didn't support him at Polokwane, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then he said, could you go to Washington? And for me, it was an extrication. When I came to Washington, Obama knew mm -hmm. that I was not pure and simple, the representative of the president, but that I had to some extent been the victim of the president. So right. I had a credibility that was um, unlike many others because I had this unfortunate tag of being the victim of the president, but that my knowing Obama was the main cause for me being sent um, to the USA. And it worked to our advantage. We restored the balance of payments, the balance of trade, um, we were able to push up um, certain sectors like the citrus sector, etc. And I was able to have a, the centenary celebrations of the ANC focused on Nelson Mandela, the life, legacy and values of Nelson Mandela, and really get out to particularly your minority communities, the African-Americans, um, and being part of the genesis towards Black Lives Matter, I was able to work with the Muslim community there and share the minority experience with them. I even uh, made surges into the Hispanic communities, um, et cetera, because I had both the credibility of being in the liberation movement, but also being a victim of Zuma and therefore not simply someone who comes to mouth preconceived okay. phrases um, and platitudes. Yeah, it was also said at the time that uh, obviously when Obama came here, he was still Senator Obama, and yeah. um, Becky gave him the cold shoulder because, as in as far as he's concerned, he was he was president. He was um, Obama was not president, therefore he didn't have to meet a, almost like a junior politician and junior unknown politician from the USA. Do you think Becky regrets not having met Obama? Becky, it would be difficult to get a regret out of him. Um, <laughs> Right. Whether you ask him about HIV AIDS, whether you ask him about his approach to Polokwane, whether you are, ask him about meeting Obama, Mbeki stands by what his intellect has led him to. Right. Um, and, and that was, he unfortunately had to pay a very high price and the country had to pay a high price for that unbending part um, yeah. of, his, of his personality. It wouldn't have hurt him to, 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 to meet, as Archbishop Tutu had called, the hoi polloi right. of the delegates at, um, at, at, at Polokwane to invest in an operation center because so much was at stake in Polokwane. Um, we understood it from the Western Cape. He certainly understood it. That's why I was available. But the move between understanding what the stakes are and acting yeah. was a step too far um, for him. But does he but, regret? I'm not sure he does. Yeah, because I mean, you were a supporter of Mbeki at the time. At least that's what people, people were saying. Mbeki 
was the first president also to interfere with the criminal justice system. Many people forget that he he suspended uh, then ad advocate Vusipi Koli, director of national director uh, director of national prosecutions, because he wanted to save or to to prevent him from arresting his buddy uh, now late uh, Jackie Silebi. And then after that, the wheels came off because you know they removed Mbeki while while Vusipi Koli was suspended, and Motlante came in and threw Vusipi Koli under the oncoming uh, Zuma bus. And, and the, since then, the, the justice system. Has, has, I don't know how it's going to take what it's, go, what it's going to take to get back there. Do you think, okay, you said it Mbeki probably doesn't, will give you a different explanation as to why he, he fired or he suspended uh, the director at the time. He also defended um, Mugabe when you look at where, where Zimbabwe is at now. He also defended Al-Bashir. I mean, you, you supported this man, but why? You know, the support is a, a very dialectical process. In 1999, when the ANC was still in the, pros, in the habit of pre-selecting their premier candidates, telling every province, if you vote for the ANC, you get this one. Right. People with long memories will remember that I was the only person who was not at Lutuli House that day for the announcement. All the other premier candidates, Shiloa, Bunda, Bailey, everyone else was there from the morning. Right. That morning while they were flying up, Mbeki was still asking me, who else can you make the premier of the Western Cape? Um, the press conference to announce the premier candidate was scheduled for two o'clock. Mm -hmm. By three o'clock, it hadn't happened. Only by five o'clock did Mbeki phone me to say, chief, We'll go with you. We've not found anyone else. Right. My response to him, there was, thank you very much for this, but I'll teach you still to respect me. Mm. And so that was the foundation on which a almost grudging respect developed mutually. Mbeki, and, and because I'm involved in global Muslim politics, I look at the ouster of Imran Khan mm -hmm. as the... Prime Minister or the, of, of, of Pakistan after midnight over the weekend. Right. The, the thing is that politics is a combination of what you do in society, the graceful um, swan on the water, and the furious kicking you have to do underneath it. Right. Mbeki was no angel, but he could do the kicking or get people to do the kicking for him. Mm -hmm. It still boggles the mind how he got Steve Chwetty to pronounce uh, Tokyo, Cyril, and others as, as, as plotting against him. I mean, that was right. bizarre. It was cynical to the extreme. That's, yeah. that's what he did to stay alive. So he did the same thing with Jackie Salebi. He needed a police um, leader who could do certain things, even if he created the gap where... Um, where, where later Zuma could fill the void right. left by uh, Vusi Piccoli. Um, but that's what he did in the moment. And so did, did, did Imran Khan understand politics similarly? Was he only the, the graceful swan above the water saying everything right to the public, etc., but not doing the kicking underneath to stay in power? Because it's the dilemma in politics between being good for society, but having to fight off your internal enemies. Right. The idealists right. are good in society and don't fight off the, the power hungry, only fight off um, their enemies to stay in power but do nothing for society. Where would we judge Mbeki? He right. gave yeah. us the biggest growth rate. Um, right. He was not obviously interested in money um, um, for, 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 for himself or his family. Um, and so that will always be the dilemma that politicians in power face. Opposition yeah. have the luxury of idealism. Um, unfortunately, when you're in power, like I found, to stay in power and to do good for society, have a growth rate in the Western Cape of 5.8%, 14 billion investment and so forth, I've had to kick enormously hard under the water against the enemies from within 
who All wanted right. to, to do certain things. I think it's the perennial dilemma of the politician. So is Ramaphosa going, okay, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a brilliant analogy you've given there of kicking inside where we don't, the, 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 the people watching from outside obviously don't see the, the, the intricate dynamics of what's going on inside the party. They see the, the tips of the tip of the aspect is it where Ramaphosa is pretty much facing the same things, isn't it? There are people uh, who are plotting to get him out of, of office by the end of this year. I don't know if you saw the interview I did with Kekal Niaos, who's part of that community of ANC cadres <laughs> who are working very hard to remove Ramaphosa and people around him because they don't feel that they are living up to the spirit of the African National Congress as they understand it. What, do you, what, do you, what would you say to Ramaphosa at this stage? Look, I think Ramaphosa needs to do a lot more kicking, mm. especially kicking out. Right. He has the Zondo Commission report. He's got a timetable to December 2022, mm -hmm. where his personal life is at stake. But I fear also the ANC's life, and I fear also the country's life. Yeah. Um, we can have preferences for other parties, but at this point still, the ANC commands the biggest chunk of your black vote um, in South Africa. So Ramaphosa carries all our fortunes. We can rebuild after him, but it will, we will first hit zero, uh -huh. rock bottom, before we, 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 we bounce back. That's the nature of a bounce. Um, I mean, the African National Congress to which you've given so much of your life, is no longer the party that many of us used, used to be so proud of for, for years. We grew up looking at this, this organization as our mm. liberators. It was our liberators. It was one of the, the main uh, players in the liberation struggle. But look at what it's become now. I mean, Ramaphosa, before he became president, people said, this, vote for this man. He's the, the last hope. But he, he has been a disappointment because he's not, he doesn't have the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. He seems to, to enjoy just sitting on the fence. He doesn't do the I kicking think, that you mentioned. No, I think that that's it. He wants to be the, the calm swan on the water, um, thinking he can reconcile irreconcilables, thinking he can play the long game in an emergency. That's been the case. But I think now that the Zondo Commission report is in his hands, two significant moves have happened. The restructuring of the National Prosecuting Authority, the provision to bring in external prosecutors from the private sector to prosecute those cases, I think needs to, um, it needs to be commended because um, with a Sean Abrams legacy there, you would get no prosecutions, you just get the files continue to be lost, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, what he has also done is he has rejigged completely the disciplinary structures within the ANC so that it is no longer the disciplinary structures of Ace Mahashule, but it right. can now become the disciplinary structures that will act against Ace Mahashule and expel those people. So those are two very important setup moves. But he has but, also found a, a, a organizational base that is rotten to the core. Yeah, um, but look, wait a minute. But you, you talk, you're talking about the, the NPA. I mean, Shamila Bautohi is a huge disappointment. Everybody said, look at this lady. She's independent minded. She comes from the International Criminals Court and she's going to do what, but she's not that. She's done nothing. You know, these days when she speaks, she speaks like a politician. She's making excuses after excuses after excuses. She hasn't really gone after all these people whose names have been named, implicated in, in corruption and state capture. It's just, why? I mean, Ramaphosa, what, what's going on there? Why, why, what's holding this woman's and her look, team's hands? Look, let me give you an example about over eagerness in going after this. If you haven't transformed the whole pyramid, you can transform the apex part, bring in a Shamila Batoi, mm -hmm. bring in a Hermione, Cronier, etc., cetera, et cetera, a Willie Hoffmeyer. But if you have not looked at the middle and the lower structures, mm -hmm. what has been left there by amongst other Sean Abrams. That's where your files get missing. That's where the right. prosecutions get messed up. If right. I can remind you, when Ramaphosa just became president, the NPA made a major raid on the Frieda farm and Ace Mahashule's office in, um, in, 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 in Bloemfontein. Uh -huh. um, there was this hope that hey, it started. But right. pretty soon, information got tampered with. Um, the files went missing. The case collapsed because we had not 
done it with the right <coughs> kind of people. I'm hoping that the depth of the transformation is deepening and that that could be the breakthrough and that where you don't trust the structure, right. you bring in advocates and lawyers from outside from the private sector to actually handle and maybe not go after every case that is mentioned in Zondo, but go for the high flyers so that it sets an example against impunity in the country. At the same time, on the ANC side of the equation, you must have the disciplinary structure. People like um, Ralph Ngajima, Johnny DeLange, Enver Surti give me a lot of hope that they will make sure that those who are truly corrupt will be exited from, right. the, from the ANC. But, but, but we have to help President Ramaphosa to step outside his nature. Because how, do, how do you help somebody step out of his nature? I mean, surely he's the president. He's the commander of South Africa's joint armed forces. He's the most powerful man in South Africa. Surely he can, leader. as president, make decisions that show South Africans that they have a president. But so far he hasn't. I mean, Just what more can you do? That this nature of his, that is innate to him, mm. is the particular nature that helped us through the transition. So now we have to tell him, Mr. President, you are not dealing with a national party that has seen its own demise and that is willing to compromise. You are dealing here with your own comrades right. who will kill you if necessary in order for them not to go to prison because the stakes are too high. He could negotiate with the national party to say, I will not put you in prison mm -hmm. if you um, accept the settlement. I will not prosecute. I will not kick you out of your jobs. I will share the cabinet with you. He can't say that to the RET forces, to the Karl Neauses, to the Jacob Zumas and all of them. He can't say it because they will take the country down. And so you've got to force him outside yeah. of his nature and say, you've got to leave this to those who can do it. And you're not able to act according to your nature. You've got to be ruthless. And that's what we've got to say to him. But it's, look, he's heading now to a, to, to a showdown in later this year. And mm -hmm. nobody can say with absolute certainty that he's going to come out the, the winner. The, these guys, you don't know what's being planned behind this. So let's, let's, let's be open-minded about this. What if he loses? Who, whom do you see replacing him within the ANC? Obviously, somebody come, coming from the RIT forces. Look, it's going, and, to be a, it's going to be a straight shootout between... Um, the, 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 the renewal forces led by Cyril Ramaphosa and the RET forces. There's, there's no gray area yeah. um, um, in the ANC. There are people who think that they will be the gray beneficiaries of a, a fallout um, or, a, or a slip between um, those two sides. But I think it's a straight shootout. And the early signs are that he could survive. Um, but I think that if he doesn't, Unfortunately, there is no replacement on the right side of the ANC. The DA has grown because it was like Puckman. It gobbled up all the other right side, um, the Freedom Front, etc., etc. On the left side, there's a ceiling, and it is a displacement effect. Before you had um, you had Azapo and PAC filling that 10%. Right. Then you had UDM filling that 10%. Then you had COPE filling that 10%. Now you've got EFF filling that 10%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the nature on the, of the political spectrum with the ANC um, going from 66% to 58%, depending on whether people turn out or not, not depending on how they make. I think mm -hmm. that people, and Ramaphosa should know this, mm -hmm. people are saying we are waiting for you to clean up and then we will come back. If it doesn't, people will exercise their choices. None of the current menu, I think, are palatable choices. The DA can't sort out its racial baggage. Mm. The EFF is more and more outrageous, um, having sipped wine on Rupert's farms. Um, before them and the RET, they now march on Rupert's farms. It's hypocrisy. Mm the politics yeah. of hypocrisy and opportunism. And so there's no real alternative, but maybe I think brewing in civil society movements could be the foundations of it. The Defend yeah. Our Democracy campaign could be 
um, an alternative. It's largely your internal UDF types that are saying, let's go back to the kind of politics we knew that was non-racial, that was egalitarian, that was progressive, non-corrupt, idealistic, etc. So I'm saying that the alternative will still have to be built. Will it be built before the country hits rock bottom? And can it be inclusive in the same sense that the UDF was an inclusive coalition? I'm not saying that the UDF, because that would be nostalgic, that the UDF is the formula, but I think that we do have a formula in the past. The app must be upgraded, and we need to make sure that um, that there are credible people and that there is a bridge between generations. We may need some from the old generation that have the memory and experience of struggle and some from the new generation that does not have the baggage that came um, with that era and that was so loyal to the ANC that he gave its life to the ANC. So but, but, we have to look they, for that alternative. But maybe the ANC is more like an old power station that has reached the end of its life. It has to be decommissioned. I mean, why must we think that South Africa can only be saved by the ANC? Maybe now the ANC must have, might have played a role in helping in saving South Africa from apartheid, but I think something else needs to come and save South Africa from the ANC. I mean, people say, I mean, do you really believe that the solutions that South Africa needs in order to heal from so many wounds will come from the African National Congress? Do you really believe that? I don't, I don't think so. I think that the ANC over the last 10 years has fundamentally been repeopled. That the good people left. Some left with cope, some left with age, some left with disgust um, and so forth. And it has been repeopled. You must remember the main campaign internally in the ANC that Zuma ran was a million members. Kosatu went out to, 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 to sign up a million members. KZN became the largest province with right. um, disillusioned Inkata people coming over to the ANC. Free State became a major bastion. It's now discovered how they bought membership. Wow. And so the fact of the matter is that the ANC has been repeopled and the, 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 the DNA of the old ANC is gone. That would have been a, a major challenge for that old DNA, including myself, mm-hmm. to reimagine and reinvent ourselves for the new tasks at hand. Yeah. Um, but it would not suffer a credibility crisis or an integrity crisis as this one is. So can we, and that's what limits Ramaphosa in his cabinet. Cabinet is chosen from parliament. Parliament is largely um, the product of Ace Mahashule's manipulation of the lists. Right. So you, 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 you choose all your good people and then you've got to choose the best of the worst. Yeah. And so that really is the, is the challenge that is being faced. So at, at the r- rational level, I agree with you that this could be, it, that it may be better to give the ANC a decent burial than a kind of... Um, decomposition process um, yeah. that's smelly and everything which we are on alternatively is there an antibiotic um, from within that could be and I think lots of people many people are giving making 2022 the watershed year for their own decisions about the longevity um, of the ANC which way the decent burial and then something new Mm-hmm. or the ongoing decomposition um, that, that, we, that we are experiencing Cause I, now. Because I get worried that we con- we're too concerned about what happens in the ANC. Of course, the ANC is the Makulu branch of South African politics, but South Africa cannot forever wait for the ANC to heal. And it, as things go, the ANC is not going to heal anywhere, any, anytime soon. They, they, one, part, one part of the ANC is going to win elections, and that part of the ANC that wins is going to say, this is how we're going to run things. The other part is going to continue fighting the part that would have won, so that the, the focus is never on healing South Africa. So the people of South Africa need to wean themselves off the ANC, really, so that they can focus on what's good for the country and not what's good for any political party. I think that we, that we, that we have generations of South Africans who understood what it was like not to have electricity. Right. 
and they will forever be grateful to an ANC that put the switch in every room, even if the lights go off for a few hours a day. So there's enough generations of South Africans who remember designating one um, child as a water fetcher uh -huh. because there was no tap and they will forever be grateful. The same with RDP houses, the same with telephone connectivity, uh -huh. the same with the intangibles like freedom, not being called a, a K word, not uh -huh. being hunted down for passing. While that generation remains more than 50% of the population, there will be a market for the ANC and there will be forgiveness. I suspect, Sully, yeah. that if Ramaphosa does not smoke the pipe in 2022, even that generation will begin to say, where's the alternative? Right. That right. is for me why I call 2022 a watershed year. If you were asked to play a role in South Africa, because I think, look, it looks like most of your very key roles were almost accidental. Becky appointed to you, you're not the first choice. You eventually said, hey, you know, you're going to be the premier of the Western Cape. Uh, Zuma appointed you for, to become ambassador for well, for ulterior, ulterior motives. And I think in all, in both cases, you did quite well for South Africa. Uh, and, maybe, and it's still a young chap in my in my eyes. <laughs> There's a role for people like you to play. What, what, what role would you see yourself play to help South Africa here? I think, Sully, you've just given me the title to my <laughs> biography, the accidental um, person. Yes. Um, but, but look, there's some, when you've been completely immersed in politics all your life, mm -hmm. and you've given half, more than half of your life to a movement, you have an undue sentimentality and hope in that movement, and I'm guilty of that. Mm -hmm. You will try everything to salvage something. I made a decision in 2019 not to go into the legislature, simply because I didn't see that I could play a role. If I see that there is an openness, that there is a new wind of change, mm -hmm. even being suggested in the ANC that Ramaphosa has the courage to act according to what is needed for South Africa. Mm -hmm. And that there's a critical mass of good people that can actually do it, then I would certainly consider it. But that's not a decision for me. I'm not even um, in the branches working it, getting nominations to get anywhere close to it. That is just a philosophical position that I would if those conditions obtain. Otherwise, I think that I've carved out a life for myself that um, is truly satisfying, that mm -hmm. is impactful on the most troubled part of the global communities, um, mm -hmm. and that I play a, a, a role for South Africa in yeah. being able to explain to foreign investors, rather than let them just pack up and implode the economy even further, explain what is going on, give them a sense, and they would trust me enough to know that if I press the panic button, that then they can panic, but they shouldn't panic before I press that panic button. Okay, I want to move to three points of the, of international, the role that South Africa plays in the international arena. The one is Israel-Palestine. Now, South Africa, we tend to, we seem to be urging the Palestinians to keep fighting, to keep fighting. Palestine or the Palestinian forces will never win a war against Israel. In the same way that the anti apartheid forces were never going to be win a war, a conventional war against the South African Defense Force of the time. So we negotiated. We have a negotiated settlement. I think it was the right way to go. Why don't we push the Palestinians to and the Israelis to really find a middle ground? To, instead of urging the Palestinians to keep fighting a war that we know they're not going to win. That's one thing. The other thing is the, the, the Western Sahara, the, the stance of South Africa on the Western Sahara, the, the Morocco situation. Where, what do you think? Is this the right way to go? How is there another way for that problem of the Western Sahara to be sorted out? That's just number two. Number three is Ukraine. I mean, South Africa stands on Ukraine and its ambivalence on condemning uh, what Putin is doing has been criticized throughout the world. What are your views on this, these three points? And what do you think South Africa should be doing? Just very, very shortly, and maybe starting with the last one. Yeah. I think the Ukraine conflict is really for me the the visibility of what i call a global interregnum 
and the interregnum is a pause in history. Mm -hmm. In this case, the two superpowers are exhausted, tired, and worn out. The US is 21 trillion overspent. Um, it's had 30 years of conflict, particularly in Muslim areas. Um, its country, its citizens are war weary. And so they've had an indecent departure from Afghanistan, creating an enormous vacuum that the Taliban has filled without even a protest um, from them. So they are completely, and, so, um, and Zelensky is, was foolish to think that the US would rush to his aid once the war started. On the other hand, um, Putin has watched how the old, also packed countries, one after the other joined NATO, and he's had to decide, can he allow um, missile bases to poke into his soft underbelly from Ukraine and make that? The, so, so, so it's not a, a war of bravado. It's a war of panic um, by Putin because the Russian empire um, cannot manage it. So what it means is not to ask which side are you on. What it means is to say, how does the global south how does the African, Asian, South American continents um, reimagine and reorganize themselves to create a truly multilateral system that isn't dependent on the old, tired, uh, veto countries um, to do their job for them? So I think to, to go into binary mode to say, oh, I'm with Ukraine or I'm with Russia, that's tired. You can't justify what is happening. And if you look at the Ukraine situation, 1962, the world forgave Kennedy. He blockaded the world because he didn't want the Warsaw countries to have missile bases in his soft underbelly in Cuba. And so this is um, we're dealing with multiple hypocrisies. So let us get rid of all of that and really make sure that our foreign policy is to cohere the global south and its entities and to say, can we push for a transformed United Nations, a transformed one and build a truly sustainable peace that is not based on equilibrium. You have a bomb, I have a bomb, but that is based on truly what is in the interest of human development. In much the same way, um, I think our left has a huge connection with the Sahrawi people in Western Sahara. Wait, just a minute, before you move there, uh, do you think South Africa should condemn the killing of innocent people in Ukraine by Russia? No, absolutely. Absolutely. It is unjust. We wouldn't tolerate it for ourselves. We wouldn't do it ourselves. We shouldn't allow it for others to, to happen. That okay. cannot be the currency of resetting the global governance um, machine. And so it absolutely, any loss of life has to be condemned. Any invasion of sovereignty has to be condemned. That is not the way in which, and this is where you miss a Nelson Mandela, um, who viewed his interests through his values. Um, he would say, what are my values? My value is preservation of life. My interest may be more with Russia, but I cannot um, pander to my interest if, my, if it contradicts my values. And right. so I think, that's the approach that we should be that we should be taking. It must be truly even-handed, without a suspicion of pandering to the one um, above the other. It must be truly focused on transforming the global order and creating a truly um, inclusive um, global governance system. Okay, and uh, Western Sahara? On the Sahrawi, I think that um, that that again. Um, we have to, we cannot be in a perpetual standoff um, with Morocco. Um, and, 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 and I'm saying that because I've had exposure um, to the Moroccan government and the Moroccan people. I've seen the, 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 the kind of foolishness on their side. South Africa could be an observer in, for example, the um, oh, I see the organization of Islamic communities, but Morocco keeps on blocking us with constant rivals. And that's what fritters away. And I'm not saying we should do it at the expense of the, of the Sahrawi, but sometimes in the case of Western Sahara, we put our solidarity ahead of our strategy. Right. We are so good at having solved our internal problems with worse enemies, yeah. and, we have not, and we have not really kind of deployed a major diplomatic thrust to find a formula that satisfies Morocco's need for maybe access to 
that part of the world or the Sahrawis need for autonomy. I think right. we are creative like that. We were creative, but sometimes when the unbridled solidarity takes over, we, we, we relax our strategic minds um, on that. And that would be the same, I think, with the Israel-Palestine situation. Look, the truth of the matter is, I don't see a Mandela or a de Klerk in that area. Mm -hmm. What I see are your kind of um, succession of PW Bortas, belligerent types on the Israeli side, and a vacuum of leadership on the other side. Right. And again, I think that we are prioritizing our solidarity, which is important with the Palestinians because they are the disempowered, they are the occupied, they are the ones uh, who are disproportionately um, um, unweaponed. Um, rockets and slingshots don't really match the, the firepower of the Israelis. On the other hand, I think um, what we do see is facts on the ground, which um, Netanyahu promised us and he has carried out, you, you will not have. I have shifted personally from activism for a two-state solution, a negotiated two-state solution, mm -hmm. to a negotiated single democratic inclusive state with one person, one vote for the whole of Palestine, Israel. That's where right. I think um, we should be um, activating for. Yeah, there's and, no physical space. There is less and less space for a, any viable Palestinian state to be built on in any case. Absolutely, absolutely. So the facts on the ground have made it impossible for a Palestinian state to emerge. And yeah. therefore, how do we, as South Africa, move away from two things? Our historical allegiance with Fatah and the PLO mm -hmm. and recognize that there are elements of corruption that are very strong there, that are that are undermining years of struggle? Mm -hmm. How do we um, at the same time create a moderating effect on Hamas and say um, there is no place for continued and unbridled warfare? It, you don't fight your enemy on their terrain of strength. Right. Um, and thirdly, South Africa must move away from its um, adherence to a two-state solution and to say one democratic inclusive state with one person, one vote. That's what we must advocate for in, in the world. I suspect that by creating a global movement for such a single democratic state, we may even begin to see a genuine attempt right. by Israelis and global Jewry to have a um, a, 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 a more viable two-state solution. And but perhaps they, maybe the, the Jewish people in Israel, Israelis fear that they might they might become the minority in such a state because this one hears that Palestinians make more babies than Israelis, their numbers are bigger, so they'd end up being the minority and they have no guarantees of how they're going to be treated. They would be treated if suddenly they were the minority. I don't understand the notion of having your cake and eating it, but that is what you don't want. You want more settlements in Palestinian territories. You make a two-state solution unattainable. And you fear how many babies the Palestinians are, are having. And that it will eventually, that you will be the loser in democracy. You can't have your cake and eat it. Right. You must choose one. Give a viable state without settlements, without restrictions on water, without destroying the economy with olive groves and all of those kind of things, or you have a single democratic state. I think that that is, that is what the world must be. And South Africa must again downplay its solidarity politics with the Palestinians and enter into strategic advisory services yeah. with the Palestinians. We have more to offer than our solidarity. You know, the Arabic saying, be ruch, be dumb, with our soul and with our blood. Mm -hmm. I, say to, I say to people, yes, with our soul, we support the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily with our blood, right. but we must start supporting them, be akal, with our strategic wisdom. Do you think South Africa, after all the, the role we've played so far, can we still be seen as a credible neutral player? I mean, I don't know what neutrality would mean in this case, but we, can we be seen as a neutral player in a 
in 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 a road to ne a negotiated one state for all you see the the idea of a neutral player is is eroded the us has never been a neutral player europe has never been a neutral player not when you make laws that any criticism of israel's right. action is anti-semitism against global jury and so the fact of the matter is there is no but what is absent are those whose hearts beat towards the oppressed in Palestine. Right. And, 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 and South Africa can play that, but it's strategic. we've already given the Palestinians a label mm -hmm. for their suffering called apartheid, apartheid Israel. Yeah. So we will not be neutral, but we are recognizing in their reality what was elements of our reality. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we are not neutral, but we can be just. Okay. We can be rational, we can be strategic, and we can be reasonable. And we are the country that have resolved a major catastrophe built up over 300 years. And we have resolved it to the admiration of the world. Why would the world admire us, but not listen to us? Yeah, good question. So we've come to the end of the show, but I have one, one last question for you, which is a simple one. You're writing a book, and I've heard, uh, you know, I'm, I can't wait for this book to come out. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? What is it about? Or the title? <laughs> so this is the book that I have. Living um, where we don't make the rules. Huh. A guide okay. for Muslim minorities. Right. And it is based on a 2013 colloquium where um, 22 different Muslim minority communities came together in mm -hmm. Paris over three days and discussed the Muslim minority condition. Right. So that book is, this is the, this is the, um, the printer's copy. The okay. copies are now being um, printed by Claritas. Mm -hmm. um, and we are hoping that after Ramadan, we would be able to get it out to the market. But the title, Living Where We Don't Make the Rules, is really the condition of Muslims. Mm -hmm. Where we are majorities, we live by the rules of authoritarians. Where we are minorities, we live by the rules of the countries we are in. Right. This is not a statement of defeat. It's a statement of aspiration. How do we, as Muslims, like in South Africa, how do we position ourselves in order to influence the rules? By voting, by being available as elected members of councils and parliaments and all of those kind of things by taking our place in civil society, by linking up in America, for example, Muslims and Black Lives Matter, because while the one faces racism, the other one Islamophobia, the root is all bigotry. And so that's really um, the essence um, of the book and to teach some South African lessons mm -hmm. um, to the global Muslim community. So we're very happy that that publication is now um, is now almost a reality, and um, hopefully it's the first of, of many. Inshallah. Yeah, I'm sure that people like myself and others, we don't have to be Muslim to be interested. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Uh, you know, I teach a course at the EU Business School looking at how to how professionals can integrate multicultural environments, and I think this kind of discussion is very important for everybody, not just for Muslims. But Ibrahim, thank you so very much for making time for me again this morning. I really appreciate it. It's never, it's very hard to end a conversation with you because there's so much more that I would like to ask you. But I appreciate you making the time, especially now during Ramadan when I know you focused on, on spiritual matters and the, the well-being of yourself, family, community. Thank you very much for being with us. No, thank you very much, Charlie. It's great um, reconnecting with you. And I'm hoping that this worldview becomes a major news outlet and... Um, content outlet for the world. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you. And to our viewers out there, if you've come this far, it means that you have enjoyed this conversation with Ibrahim Rasul. I, it's hard to imagine anyone not enjoying it. Please keep following us. I'm sure that after this conversation, you, you should feel yourself empowered and, you know, to know more, to understand more and to have your worldview enhanced in a lot of ways. Keep following us on worldview.com. Thank you very much.